Hi, this is Leslie Kaufman. I'm a senior climate change reporter for Bloomberg News. I'm so happy to be here today at the Global Inclusive Growth Summit talking on a very important topic, which is how to influence consumer behavior to address an important topic, which is climate change. Today, our guests include Katie Milkman. She is a professor of operations, information, and decisions at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of How to Change. She's advised organizations, including Google, the White House, the US Department of Defense, on how to spur positive change. And who to better understand consumers than our other guest today, that's Alan Jope. He is the CEO of Unilever, the consumer goods giant. They serve billions of people every day. Prior to this, he was president of the company's beauty and personal care division and held leadership roles in North America and Asia. He is also an executive committee member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I think I'd like to also note that Unilever has committed to achieving a deforestation-free supply chain by 2023. That means that by the end of 2023, their raw materials will come from places that are verified as deforestation-free. So as we get ready to talk about consumers, and we're going to talk about them a lot today, I want to first ask both of you about the responsibility of corporations to lead on this issue. After all, they're far more knowledgeable about the destructive cause of their supply chains than their consumers. So how much are they responsible for making changes and educating their consumers on the changes? And then we'll get to the consumers. Alan, should we start with you and then get to Katie? Sure. Well, first of all, Leslie, thank you very much for uh, hosting us. Um, <clears throat> let me get straight into it. Uh, our view is that the world faces three great challenges. Um, the climate emergency, the destruction of nature, and the growth and in inequality in the world. And none of those are a good place for business. Um, a, a world that's three degrees warmer or four degrees warmer than pre-industrial levels is uh, catastrophic for our, our business. And Unilever can only be a healthy company if we're living and doing business in healthy societies and on a healthy planet. So we have thrown out our old business strategy and our old sustainability strategy and, and created one new integrated uh, business and sustainability strategy. We've set um, ambitious business goals and ambitious sustainability goals. So you mentioned deforestation free by 2023, which is just around the corner. But we have uh, very ambitious net zero uh, goals, scope one and two by 2030 and scope full scope by 2039. Uh, we've got water stewardship programs. We've got um, commitments on 100% sustainable sourcing of uh, many of our materials. Um, I'll just say one word on how we think about our model of change. The first is to get our own house in order. So I've given a few examples, but you know we're, we've committed to having food waste in our operations, uh, levels of recycled plastic, 100% electrical vehicles, things that are under our balanced gender uh, uh, in our management, things in our own control. Then we look at our value chain, all of our suppliers principally, and we're now asking all of our suppliers to comply with our uh, regenerative agriculture principles as part of tackling these big issues of climate, nature, and uh, inequality. But our biggest impact comes actually through our brands and our products, where the products themselves can be improved through things like concentration, compaction. Uh, we're moving our products away from fossil fuel-derived carbon to renewable and recycled sources of carbon. We're trying to sell more plant-based uh, proteins um, to replace dairy and, uh, and meat. And um, our brands can speak up like uh, our brand Dove, which is the biggest brand in the company, is doing quite a lot on girls' self-esteem. And then finally, the, so having got our own operations in order, work on our, our value chain, use our brands as a force for good, the outermost layer is what we do on advocacy and the action that we take um, in wider society, working with business, working with government, working with regulators, working with NGOs, and of course, working with academics uh, like Katie. Well, Katie, how about this? Do, should corporations be, are doing the, are they doing enough to lead and do they have a responsibility to lead on this issue? Yeah, it's a great question. I absolutely think that 
corporations have a responsibility here. But I also think that governments have a huge responsibility here. And one of the reasons that corporations are having to lead is because governments aren't doing enough. Uh, consumers have a responsibility as well. We have a responsibility to vote and also to live our lives in ways that support sustainability goals and to uh, spend our money with companies that are producing products and showing values that are aligned with the long-term goals that are so important. So uh, it's not just up to corporations. If it, if it were, I think we'd be in trouble because not all are acting as responsibly as Unilever. But I do think corporations can help. Uh, we need everybody chipping in to make this climate crisis turn out in a way that isn't catastrophic. So let's talk about consumers now. How much do they care about these issues, particularly climate change? And does that show up in any meaningful way in how they buy products? Absolutely. So consumers make value-based judgments when they buy a lot of products. And so if they know a brand is aligned with their identity, they're more interested in buying from that brand. Um, it's particularly important when they're buying products that are visible to others, right? The shoes we buy, the clothing we wear, the cars we drive, those are signals to other people about what we value and our identity. And we care particularly about those products, again, because they're visible to other people and they, they say to, they make a statement. Um, but we care in all of the products that we buy that, that we're not contributing to evil. It's important for consumers to know what companies are doing and what their values are and, and what investments they're making, though, because if they don't know, they won't necessarily make purchases that are based on uh, these decisions. So that could be the responsibility of the organization to highlight when they're making great decisions. But there's also a role for, for different groups to come in and educate consumers about that. And Alan, do you find that when consumers say they care about the climate change, that actually aligns with their actions? I mean, do we have statistics to show that yeah. this really, that it shows up in their purchases? So, uh, Leslie, let me uh, be explicit about what everyone already knows, which is businesses like Unilever are not a charity. We're not an NGO. Uh, we're in business to look after all the stakeholders. My priority actually begins with our employees, but I have a response, a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders. So we have to generate attractive financial returns. We are not a charity. And our actions are, are taken in enlightened self-interest. And absolutely, we're seeing a change in consumer uh, sentiment and behavior. Um, I think 2021 actually is a tipping point um, not just because of the pandemic, but um, it's just more evident than ever that cities are underwater, uh, continents are reaching record temperatures and melting in some cases. And you know, large parts of Europe and Western United States are literally on fire. So it's, it's very climate, the climate emergency has gone from an abstract thing to a very tangible uh, thing. And there's many, many surveys, you know, there's the one that Deloitte did that showed two thirds of people are now already limiting their use of single use plastic. 43% of consumers are choosing brands that uh, talk about their environmentally sustainable practices. 36% um, are reduced. It's not that we'll all become vegan or vegetarian overnight, but people are just adjusting a little bit to more plant-based diets. And we're certainly seeing that in our business. I'll give you two examples. We measure our brands on how the consumer sees them in regards to their responsible behavior for society or planet. And our brands, which index highly on being seen as responsible uh, for, con for either the planet or society, are growing twice as fast as the rest of our portfolio. And then maybe more interestingly, we see a generational effect. There's a cohort effect where baby boomers um, don't change their behavior. Now, of course, for every generalization, there's exception, but at a, at a macro level, baby boomers do not change their behavior um, to make uh, responsible purchasing behaviors. My generation, Gen X, are even worse. We say we do, but in fact, don't. Um, then Gen X, uh, it's a very big driver of uh, millennials. It's a big driver of the behavior. But Gen Z, it's almost the only thing driving brand choice is the conduct of the brand or the company behind the brand. So 
frankly, it's a, a matter of survival for companies to start to uh, take serious action on these matters that young people really care about. Well, Katie, what about these Gen Xers or maybe the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, let's start, people who say they have these values but then don't actually um, act on them. What are some of the obstacles they might face? Like, why aren't they doing it? And since you've actually written the book on how to change, how do we change these people so that they do make responsible decisions? One of the biggest challenges when it comes to the climate crisis is that a fundamental feature of human behavior is that we all exhibit something called present bias. And present bias means that even though we know potentially, in some cases, what the long-term goals are that we want to achieve, we've established our values, uh, we care, say, about the climate, uh, we often overweight the instant gratification or the instant value we'll get from our choices relative to the long-run returns. And what that means is we reach for the most convenient option in the moment, uh, whether there's a plastic straw or a paper one available, we may not pay that much attention in the heat of the moment, right? We may uh, decide we want to take the most convenient route to work as opposed to thinking about our um, the, the carbon footprint that we're making. And when we're trying to buy a nice, attractive outfit, we might look for the one that's going to be uh, on sale as opposed to the one that's going to be best for the world. So even though we have these long-term goals, often present bias leads us not to behave in ways that are aligned with those long-term goals. So how do we fix that is a really important question. I think one thing that uh, we, we can do is, as consumers, set goals for ourselves that are uh, really clear and make plans about how we're going to follow through. There's a lot of research suggesting that when you have clearer goals and you do that long-term thinking in advance, then when you find yourself in the heat of the moment, faced with a choice, you're more likely to actually do what's in your long-term best interest because you've considered it, you've planned ahead, and you're not caught like a deer in the headlights. Um, another thing that we can do is uh, actually try to make it more fun to pursue those long-term goals. This is something that brands can do for us and many are doing, by the way, but we can look for ways to do it as well. Uh, as long as we can make it more enjoyable in the moment to do what's right and look for green options that will actually you know, not only add value in the long run, but that will make us satisfied in the short run. And that can mean thinking about your diet, right? If, if you wanna eat uh, less meat, then looking for diet alternatives that you actually really enjoy, not just things that are sinless, is super important in order to make sure that you'll persist. Because if you don't enjoy it in the moment, if there isn't reward right now, unfortunately, even though we know what we value, we often make the wrong decision. Let me just agree with uh, what Katie's saying, which is it's really important to avoid trade-off thinking. So I get a question a lot. What about sustainability versus profit? The minute we get into that false dichotomy, we are absolutely doomed. We've got to see sustainable business as a pathway to better profitability. Well, it's the same for brand choices. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Have you tried using laundry detergent capsules? They usually come in a plastic tub or a plastic bag. Now, these little capsules, what they, they, they sweat. And when they're contained in a plastic bag or a plastic tub, that sweat causes them to kind of stick together. And uh, we've been able to develop, it's as simple as it's a cardboard box instead of a plastic tub that not only is it lower cost for us, so it's financially attractive, not only is it far better for the environment because it's easily recycled and has a far lower carbon footprint, it generates a better product experience for the consumer because those laundry uh, detergent capsules can breathe and you don't get that buildup of sweat. So you have a higher quality product for the consumer. They feel better about their choice because it's uh, uh, a sustainable piece of packaging. And frankly, we make a better margin. And uh, I could rattle off tons of examples of that. Our vegan Hellman's mayonnaise or our vegan uh, Magnum ice creams are preferred for their taste they're better margin for us, and everyone knows they're better for health and better for the planet. Well, all of you, thank you so much for this. This was an incredibly enlightening conversation, and I really appreciate your all being with us. I'm Leslie Kaufman from Bloomberg. Thank you very much.